Okay. So um, officially to start, um, my name is Eileen Michelli and I'm with the Marfan Foundation. Welcome to our special surgery series, which is part of our educational efforts for Marfan Awareness Month. We are thrilled to bring to you outstanding medical information from leading surgeons around the country who are also huge champions for the Marfan Foundation and our community. Um, tonight, we're featuring a leading surgeon from Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Eric Fuselli, who we've been chatting with already. More on him soon. But first, I'd like to introduce Michael Weimer, the president and CEO of the Marfan Foundation, to welcome you. Thanks, Eileen. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. It's nice to see the numbers climbing here as we, as we get started. Uh, happy early Valentine's Day. I guess we're only a few days away at this point. Just a couple of very quick things, because uh, I know time is of the essence here. Uh, we will soon be announcing that there will be a virtual annual conference this year. My guess is Eileen probably has a slide on that uh, later on. Uh, July 8th through 11th are the dates that we're targeting. And then next year, we will be back live uh, in Newport Beach, I should say in person. Uh, we're live this year as well, but uh, in Newport Beach um, around the same period of time and second week of July uh, with the uh, with Hogue uh, out there. So um, we're really thinking next year we'll work out in person and then uh, the following year we're hoping to be uh, in Chicago. So quick lineup as to where we're heading annual conference wise. Uh, we're also really really proud. You see some logos on the bottom here. You know, not only do we have the Marfan Foundation, uh, this past uh, summer, we welcomed the Lois Dietz Foundation. Uh, we have, uh, we, we created the VEDS movement, Vascular EDS, about one year ago. And then this fall, the GenTAC Alliance, a research arm uh, became part of the foundation as well. So lots going on uh, around the foundation, several other events tonight as well. Um, you know, we are blessed tonight to have Dr. Rosselli with us. Uh, I can tell you he is a staff favorite, uh, has been an extraordinary supporter of the foundation, as has uh, the Cleveland Clinic. I was looking earlier tonight, uh, average is 350 surgeries per year, pretty remarkable, 150 book chapters and articles, um, and enjoys probably most caring for so many families that are uh, in difficult moments. So uh, we're blessed to have him as a, as a surgeon, we're blessed to have him as a volunteer, and you're blessed to have him as part of our, our larger community. So uh, thank you very much. And I'll turn it back to Eileen. Great, thank you, Michael. So um, we have so many registrants coming on tonight. We're excited to bring this presentation to you. I just want to remind everybody um, that we have a Q&A box on your screen and that's where you should post any questions for Dr. Roselli. Um, if you could please wait until after the presentation because he will likely answer a lot of it. Um, when he, while he's speaking. Also, if you have any questions, try to just get to the crux of the question without all the personal information, all the hard parts to read through that to get to the question. Um, and you don't need to use the chat box for that. And you also don't have to raise your hand, just put your questions in the Q&A box. So anyway, Michael gave the informal introduction of Dr. Roselli. I get to give you all the, the formal part of it, which is that Dr. Roselli is the chief of adult cardiac surgery and director of the Aorta Center and a staff surgeon in the Cleveland Clinic Department of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery. He's also on the teaching faculty at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine. Dr. Roselli has a special interest in surgery for thoracic aortic aneurysm and dissection, including endovascular treatment, aortic valve repair and replacement, including minimally invasive and percutaneous treatment, high-risk reoperation surgery, and surgery, surgery for cardiovascular tumors. He also has a special place in his heart for our community of people with Marfan, Lily seats, and beds. Cleveland Clinic, as Michael mentioned, is a champion for our Cleveland Walk for Victory. And it's also one of the leading institutions in the country for the efforts for aortic disease awareness week. And of course they get accolades for so many other things leading in the country. So now I will pass the remote to Dr. Dr. Rosselli and um, you'll hear from him. Thanks, Eileen. Thanks, Michael. It's really great to be here. Uh, I, I really appreciate everyone uh, getting connected. I'm going to um, go over to the share screen mode and just uh, take a second to get my slides up. Make sure that we can do this properly. Although uh, we're all getting pretty good at these virtual connections these days. I want to make sure I'm getting this all up properly.
Can you see my screen? You're perfect. Just put it in slide and put in full slide mode and you're good. Got it. Still good? Yes, looks good. Okay. Great. So um, I've been asked to speak about aortic root surgery and connective tissue conditions. And uh, um, I'm really honored to be here tonight because it is February, which is Marfan Awareness Month. And in the state of Ohio, as of this year, we just signed into law with Governor DeWine uh, this week, February 13th, is Aortic uh, Disease Awareness Day in the state of Ohio. And so um, I'm excited about all the kinds of efforts uh, that happen to improve awareness about this problem, because as many of you know, um, some, in, some in more difficult ways than others, the, uh, the ability um, to recognize these problems sooner and get treatment sooner helps to save lives. And so the hope is that the more we can improve awareness, uh, the better we can do at taking care of people. I know that many of you in the audience, of course, understand the aorta, uh, but just to quickly review the anatomy, I think it's important to understand we talk about the aorta in segments and the focus of the conversation today is gonna to be about the very first segment of the aorta. The aortic root is the shortest segment of the aorta but also one of the most complex segments because it's where the aortic valve lives and where the coronary arteries arise. And of course, it's the location where we most commonly see aneurysms in patients with connective tissue disorders. I'm also gonna do a quick review here on this picture on the left, the histology review. And, and again, I, I, you know, if I'm getting too scientific, I apologize, just ignore me for a second. If, uh, if, if you have questions, I'd love to talk to them about it earlier. Uh, what, what I love about my connective tissue disorder patients is um, they're often just super knowledgeable about what's going on. And I think that's really important to put your mind at ease and to help each other take care of you better um, is, to, is to improve the knowledge. And, and that helps with, with um, I think, quelling fear a bit. So what I like to say is that the aortic, the aorta and all the blood vessels in our body are like a three ply hose. And we have these three layers, the adventitious, the really tough layer on the outside. We've got this media or that middle layer where there's a lot of um, communication and a lot of the really complex function of that organ occurs and a lot of the maintenance of the, the aorta and, and the vessels occurs. And then there's the endothelium or the intima layer. That's the smooth layer that interacts with blood. With atherosclerotic disease, like coronary artery disease and plaque, we see a lot of that involves sort of those inner layers. But with degenerative diseases like aneurysm and dissection, we see the problem occurs in that middle layer. We know that aortic disease can be fatal. The picture on the left is an aortic root aneurysm. You can see there's a little this little ear here is the right oracle or the, a bit of the right atrium hanging over what's a very bulgy looking aortic root that then tapers into a normal caliber aorta just above it. That's a very focal root aneurysm. And on the right, this is a thing we want to avoid. This is an aortic dissection. You can see that aorta just looks like a, it came out of the, the, the boxing gym and it's ready to go. So why, why do aortic aneurysms and aortic dissections happen? Pathophysiology, what's the cause? Well, what's ha what happens before someone has an aortic dissection or before someone develops an aneurysm really is happening at a microscopic level. I talked to you already about those three layers in the media is where things are breaking down. So you see the images on the left where we see this really nice orderly alignment of these black fibers or these elastin fibers and the yellow stuff's collagen. Uh, the kind of prettier color image on the left is one from my lab where we study aortas. And on the right side, you can see a degenerated aorta where it just looks totally disordered in this sort of brownish stained image. And then the image on the right again is another one from my lab where we do some more complex histology and use some different kind of staining techniques. And it's pretty colors, but there is no order in this. And you can see the blue stuff 
is the proteoglycan or some of the, the goo that sort of collects in this space. So like what, I, what I'll tell folks is in this media layer, we have a whole bunch of structures that are lined up. Elastin is like elastic. It allows for stretch, allows the walls of the aorta to tolerate all the stress that it's, uh, it, that it's exposed to 100,000 times a day when your heart beats. There's no part of your, your body that takes more stress than that first part of your aorta, and it has to handle it. Uh, the, inside those layers, there's also some smooth muscle cells. Those are sort of the little powerhouses and the little brain inside of the, the wall that sort of communicates with all those different structures in the walls. And the, and the proteoglycans, you can see just little subtle touches of that blue stuff on the left and, and excessive accumulation of it on the right is sort of the shock absorber material that helps to keep all of that, uh, all of those structures intact. And when we get too much of that, that proteoglycan material that accumulates, the smooth muscle cells start to separate from the other structures. And there's a lack of communication between all those structures and a lack of maintenance of that integrity of that wall, and it starts to break down. This is a closer look at that. Again, at the top is the nice orderly organization of these layers. And at the bottom, you can see there's too much of this extra stuff that's accumulated. There's supposed to be proteins that kind of clean that space and maintain that space. There's just been too much stress on the walls of this. And so that occurs by a process we call maladaptive remodeling. The picture on the top left, you can see these MRI pictures, this green and red. It, on the left is normal blood flow through the aorta. As the aorta starts to stretch out, the stress from blood flow on the aorta starts to hit different parts of the wall in different ways. And as that aortic wall becomes abnormal, its ability to sort of correct and protect and reconstruct itself, uh, it gets altered. And so this stress produces more stress and then it's a big cycle that happens. So it's related to the genetic problem because of some of the proteins inside the walls of that vessel are no longer able to communicate and interact with each other in such a way to maintain the integrity of those walls. Uh, you know, I say it's like the custodial services of the walls is the, all the stuff in between. It's supposed to just clean itself up and handle all that stress, but the, the stress begets more stress. And as the walls start to break down, we see it all becomes disordered. And you can see some, maybe some familiar names in here, uh, fibrillin, uh, fibrillin microfibrils, uh, TGF beta receptors. These are all the elements at this microscopic level that allow all these things to communicate with each other and stay nice and orderly like the cartoon on the left that somehow goes awry from all that stress and then starts to break down. And so uh, that's where the problem occurs at the microscopic level. And it's, it's made worse when your aorta is under excessive stress. And that's why we try to make sure that people's blood pressure is well controlled. So we know that thoracic aortic disease is commonly familial. You, everyone in this audience, I'm sure, knows a lot about Marfan, Lois Dietz, Ehlers Danlos, and other syndromes like Turner syndrome. There's other genetically triggered associations associated with some of these other, um, uh, other uh, genes. And then there's several, what we call variants of known, unknown significance. So as we're learning more and more about the genetic basis of this, uh, we call a variant of unknown significant uh, something where we see one of the genes may look abnormal, but we don't we don't call it uh, a cause until we can really correlate that abnormality with some breakdown in those processes I just described in those last couple of slides, and we have a lot of work to do. So the work of the Marfan Foundation is fantastic and awesome. And I, you know, we, we need help to continue to learn more. I remember just about a dozen years ago when we would do a genetic screen, we could barely get it paid for by insurance. And maybe we'd screen for a half a dozen genes. Now those genetic panels are almost consistently paid for. Um, we've got these wonderful clinical geneticists that work with us that help to make sure that those things are taken care of. 
And, um, and depending on the panel, there's a few different companies that run these aorta panels. It's about 25 genes that we're able to screen for. That's, that's awesome compared to what we did just, not, just, just a decade or so ago. But we think because we can see in families where these problems occur, we think that we're only sort of touching on about 20% of it right now. There may be as many as 70, 80, or 100 different genetically associated triggers. So we have a lot more to learn and a long way to go, but we'll get there. Because of this revolution of knowledge about how all these different components uh, interact inside our aortas and our blood vessel walls, we have lots of targets for potential treatment. So the more we understand what's happening, the more we can develop ways to slow it down. Those new therapies are on the horizon and uh, um, we continue to move forward. Well, why is it that the aortic root is involved when in patients with connective tissue disorder? Honestly, I don't know. I don't know exactly why, but because of what I was just talking about, about the, um, the stress, the physical stress on the walls, and now that sort of exposes a genetic vulnerability, it's not surprising that it's the root that's most involved because it's the part that's closest to the heart that's exposed to the greatest forces. Again, 100,000 times away a day, that aortic root is taking a beating. Why we see some differentiation in sometimes where there's a root aneurysm and then the rest of the aorta looks okay, um, it may be also related to the fact that the different parts of the aorta come from different embryologic origin. So at their very base, they are different kinds of cells. They are different kinds of tissues that develop over time. We're studying some of that in my lab, these regional differences, and others have done this as well. You can see in the cartoon on the right that the yellow cells down at the base of the heart where the aortic root sits come from one portion of the embryologic development, the second heart field, whereas the ascending aorta and the arch come from what we call cardiac neural crest cells. Uh, so for example, patients with bicuspid valves often have an aneurysm that just involves that first portion and then that will be totally normal in the next segment where the descending aorta comes from paraxial mesoderm. And uh, there, these aren't hard boundaries. They're sort of um, a, a blend of how these different cells become these portions of the aorta. But I'm sure that those embryologic origins have something to do with the fact uh, that we see some regional difference is because from their very beginning, those portions of the aorta are a little bit different. But I want the audience to understand, especially those of you who may have some fear about all this, uh, the more, sometimes the more you learn, it's kind of scarier to know what's going on, especially if a diagnosis of a connective tissue disorder is new. But I want, I want you to hear me when I tell you that you are not just a genetic code. You are an individual. Every person should have their treatment plan tailored to the specifics of who they are. Not just the details of what's going on with your aorta, but the details of who you are as a person. You're not just, you know, your age, where you come from, the other conditions that you have. You might have other medical problems, your own specific family history. And then when you're choosing treatment, you need to look at the, the team that's taking care of you the same way. So when we make treatment decisions about risks and benefits, we tailor it based on all of these things. The details of the aortic disease, the details of, of all the other issues with the patient uh, and, and their situation and our own experience about what we can and can't do. And I think that's critical to understand. I, I um, just saw a gentleman today who's in his 60s uh, before he was diagnosed with Marfan syndrome and doesn't have any of the outward features, but a really astute uh, clinician sort of noticed a, a couple of subtle things in him uh, after he had his aortic dissection. And uh, uh, interestingly, he was uh, shown to have Marfan syndrome based on a fibrillinopathy that was found on his genetic testing. Everybody's different. I've got patients in their 70s uh, who have completely different stories about how their uh, genetic predisposition has affected them and their family. Uh, and each individual in a family might have different ways that they present. That's why the studies that show us things about mice uh, don't always translate into treatments for humans because we're much more complex. And again, we're, we're not just our genetic codes, but we got to respect that information and we got to take it into consideration when we make decisions about what we do in our life and the way we treat things. So what do we do when we find a patient has an aortic root aneurysm? 
Well, there's kind of four commonly, uh, more commonly uh, performed operations um, that I'm going to discuss here. Uh, a fifth one would be a ROS procedure, but we typically don't use those procedures in patients with connective tissue disorder because we worry about the integrity of that, that pulmonary artery that gets transferred. But typically what we do is replace the aortic root. Uh, a mechanical composite valve graft is where the, uh, a, a fabric graft and a valve are combined and sewn into the heart. The coronary artery is connected and the whole uh, root and the ascending aorta are replaced. That can also be done with a combination of a biologic valve, like a cow valve inside of a graft. A holograft or an allograft is a human aorta, a human cadaver aorta. Um, in the 90s, we replaced a lot of aortas and aorta roots that way, thinking they might last longer because they come from a human. But in the end, they ended up wearing out um, kind of at the same pace as like a, a bovine or a, or a porcine uh, aorta and aortic valve do. And it's because it's not alive. It's more like a tanned piece of leather. It's going to wear out with the wear and tear of time. And then the, our, our kind of uh, favorite, I suppose, or, or, or preferred operation for someone with connective tissue disorder, if they're a good candidate for it, and if the team has experience with it, is what we call a valve preserving root replacement. Usually, um, th there's a couple different techniques. Uh, I think the generic term is a valve preserving root replacement is a way to think about it. You can see the picture in the corner, the patient's native valve is re-implanted into that graft. That's typically referred to as a David's procedure or a re-implantation procedure. There's a lot of different ways to do that, but there's subtle differences you don't have to worry about. It's more something, uh, a technical thing for surgeons, how they differentiate different ways they sew it in. Um, there is a, a couple of different ways to do a valve preserving root where they don't re-implant it. They do a, um, a remodeling procedure, um, but uh, newer data shows that uh, if that's done with a ring to support it, you get the same kind of benefits as a reimplantation procedure, but that's a little less common. Either way, valve preserving roots are a great way to take care of it in patients with connective tissue disorders because as I show in this little video on the right where the valve is inside this aorta, this is a living valve, you can see that the valve is not just the moving parts. It's not just the cusps. It's not just those leaflets that open and close. It's the whole structure of the aortic root that allows that valve to work well. You can see in that video here, this is where blood is leaving the heart, that the, the opening of the heart, we call the left ventricular alpha tract, expands with each ejection of the heart. And it's a very dynamic structure. And uh, um, uh, the, the valve sparing root helps to maintain some of that function. How do we do with these operations? Well, survival after uh, David's root replacement procedure and connective tissue disorder is very good. 96% uh, at five years, 94% at eight years. And this experience we published uh, quite a few years ago now, we've got at least twice as many patients with connective tissue disorder in their, in our series. There's been no operative deaths and, uh, and only one stroke and, and that's a, um, relatively minor stroke and the patient recovered well. What does this operation look like? Well, we, we sew right to the inside of the heart. So we're not counting on any of that aortic tissue down in the root that's, that's been damaged to maintain any of this, the strength just to help support the valve itself that we put inside the graft. And it looks like this, where you can see the graft goes down all the way down to the inside and sewn to the muscle on the inside of the heart. Why do we do these operations? Well, we do these operations because we want to avoid this problem, acute aortic syndromes and aortic dissection. You see the picture on the left, the arrow points to a really big tear in the aorta. The image on the right, so some clot that's developed on the inside of the aortic walls. I'm about to show a brief video of, a, of a, what it looks like when we open someone's chest with an aortic dissection. If you're uncomfortable with this, please uh, look away. I'll tell you when it's safe to look again. So here we are, we're opening, the chest is open. We're opening the, the sac around the heart and you see all that old bloody fluid in there. We've uh, cooled this patient and we're taking this aorta out. And you can see we've taken out that portion of the aorta that was dissected. You can see a huge, really nasty looking rip. It's, it's amazing that people make it to the hospital when this happens because it's really starting to fall apart. And here we can inspect this valve. And a lot of times if, if the patient's stable enough and the experienced center, 
we can save that valve. We try to do that in patients with connective tissue disorder, but sometimes the tissues are just too damaged and the better and safer thing to do is just replace that root and replace that valve with one of those mechanical or biologic valve options. And you can see in this patient, the annulus was enlarged, the opening of the heart was big. So when someone has an aortic dissection, you can come back if you were looking away. When someone has an aortic dissection, the complications are rupture of the aorta. Exsanguination means bleeding out. Pericardial effusion, you saw that dark bloody fluid in the space around the heart, that can actually suffocate the heart and cause it to fail if it doesn't get drained and treated fast enough. Aortic valve regurgitation, you saw also in that video where the valve was sort of, there was a bunch of cl blood clot kind of behind and inside those layers where they started to come apart. If the valve is pulled away from the wall of the uh, aorta, it will leak. And if it leaks really badly, it can cause a patient to develop heart failure. And then uh, the other uh, cause of death is when the dissection extends downstream and shears off the branch vessels that supply any of the important organs in your body. So it can cut off the blood, blood, blood flow to the heart by cutting off the coronary arteries, the blood flow to the brain in the aortic arch, or the blood flow to other vital organs like the intestines and, uh, and or potentially put limbs at risk. Uh, and so it's important uh, that if you're having some of those kinds of uh, sequelae of this, of this dissection, that it get treated even sooner. So that's why we try to fix aneurysms. We try to fix them before they dissect. Unfortunately, you know, the, 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 the guideline of how to do this is based on the size. But we see in this data here that a lot of aortas will still develop this acute aortic syndrome, a, a dissection or a tear at a smaller size than the recommended size. So the general recommendations are that the aorta should be replaced when an aneurysm gets to five and a half centimeters or larger. Uh, we typically lower that threshold for most patients because most patients we see are younger, might, even though they might not necessarily have a connective tissue disorder, we're still suspicious that they do if they're young. And I consider everybody less than 70 young. Um, and so, um, because we can do those operations safely, we typically will lower that threshold down to five. And if someone has a non-connective tissue disorder with a higher risk, uh, genetic abnormality, like some, some of the Lowy's Dietz syndrome sort of abnormalities, we may even lower that threshold to 4.2, 4.3, four and a half centimeter range. A lot of that depends also on your family. If you had a family member had a dissection, you knew how big the aorta was when that happened. We don't ignore that. That's what I was talking about earlier about this sort of personalized care where we really take all the elements of you into consideration when we take care of somebody. Hopefully we'll find other ways to guide us besides just the size of the aorta. But what I think is important to also understand is that survival is improving for patients with Marfan syndrome and other connective tissue disorders. In this you know, paper back in the 70s, the average age of somebody with Marfan was only about 45. Uh, another paper, which is, still, is pretty old, 25 years ago, we saw a lot of patients uh, where the life expectancy was extending above 70. And now uh, we're doing even better than that. And hopefully improving the quality of life for people as well, as we can offer safer and better operations on segments of the aorta that are involved or other, or other parts of the body that are involved by connective tissue uh, disorders. Um, I showed you the, the quick survival curve from our series, but um, we looked at 178 patients who underwent that David's reimplantation procedure at our institution, and 84% of them had Marfan's. Uh, the other 16% uh, had other connective tissue disorders. About a third had really uh, quite leaky aortic valves. Um, in a proportion of them, we did extended repairs into the A-arch plus some mitral valve repairs. And again, the patients did really well no deaths, one stroke, and, and one infection. Uh, I, I already showed you this. Uh, I'm sorry, that was a duplicated slide. But we also looked at freedom from reoperation. And uh, in the follow-up of this patients, there was a freedom from reoperation of better than 90% at six years uh, and uh, freedom uh, from uh, valve operations, 93% at, uh, at five years. It's important to um, also, when you're choosing a, a surgeon and a team, 
if you have the if you have the chance to do so, if it's an elective surgery, to appreciate that experience matters. In this uh, uh, assessment of the database from the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, they looked at thir over 13,000 operations that involved the aortic root or a combination of the valve and the ascending aorta at 741 centers. Interestingly, 25% of the operations were performed at 3% of the centers. A large volume center was defined as one in that core, upper quartile did more than 30 cases a year. Uh, we do about 450 routes uh, a year at the Cleveland Clinic and ABR and ascendings and it would make it about 600. Um, if it was a large volume center, the mortality was half of what it was at a low volume center, 3% versus 6%. And so that experience is critical. At the Cleveland Clinic uh, in 2020, we did 1,381 operations, only a couple percent lower than 2019. We were affected by the pandemic, but fortunately, uh, people understood that their uh, cardioaortic disease was, was problematic, and we were able to uh, maintain safety in our institution and continue to provide care for patients over the last year, and we, and we hope to continue to do so going forward. Um, we also when we look at the valve operations that we do, because again, I think you have to think about the root and the aortic valve together. You can see that in the over three and a half thousand valve operations that we did, many of them are combined. And in that 58% of combined valve operations, a lot of those include the aorta patients. This is our volume of valve reimplantation procedures. Um, Dr. Svensson really built the program here in the early 2000s and I joined him in 2005. And then after gaining some experience and helping to train some other surgeons, we've really ramped it up and we're consistently doing over 100 operations uh, of these valve reimplantation or David procedures every year. And with that experience, it allows us to do even more complex routes. Like this patient, you see the green arrow shows a valve that is just really stretched out by the aneurysm. It looks like a, like a bowstring, um, but the tissue on the cusps was healthy. And the rest of that route, it gets reconstructed when we do a David's procedure. And so we were able to save that valve, that living valve, and reimplant it in the route and make it look like this. This is a patient of mine. That valve still working pretty well. It's about six or seven years later. And when we looked at all four of those different kind of root operations I talked about, the mechanical and biologic composite valve grafts, the homographs, and the, and the valve preserving procedures over this period of time with nearly 1,000 patients, the overall mortality was less than 1%, and the stroke rate was also low. Uh, remember, some of those uh, are older patients uh, getting these procedures. Um, and, uh, and I thought that uh, this was important to share and demonstrates that a, a, an experienced center with uh, a lot of volume and experienced surgeons uh, can have even better results. So what's next? What's next for how we're gonna treat aortic roots and aortic valves? Well, there's ongoing studies that are looking at NOACs, which are novel oral anticoagulant drugs like Eliquis. You sometimes you see these commercials for these things. They say, don't take it if you have a valve. Well, that's because it hasn't been studied in valves, but it's being studied for mechanical valves now. There's a, a PROACT study for the Onyx valve that's ongoing. Um, there are a couple of new uh, artificial valves that are in development where they're looking at polymer materials for the leaflets that may be more durable than some of the biologic tissue valves, uh, but still don't require any coagulation. So I think we're seeing some, some very interesting technology coming down the pike for the, for the valves. And when we think about uh, what to do with the aorta, the picture on the left is something called a Paris procedure. Um, maybe we can talk about the, that in discussion. Um, it's, uh, it's very experimental. And, and for now, I, I think that there are, um, uh, a lot of unanswered questions about it, but if, if we can do something like that in some minimally invasive way where we can change the structure of the wall of the aorta, um, which is what they're trying to do with the Paris procedure, um, I think there's a lot of mechanical, potential mechanical solutions that we can offer to people as we understand uh, the interaction, the interface between devices and patients. Well, what about beyond the root? Dr. Crawford, who is one of the real pioneers from Houston who taught uh, and learned and taught how to, uh, us all how to fix the more downstream portions of the aorta, like the thoracal abdominal aortas, so that no patient should be considered cured of aortic dissection. 
And we know that even after you have a prophylactic operation on your aortic root, that sometimes patients will still come back with a new dissection. Not the dissection of the part that's run replaced, thank goodness. That, that's the most dangerous portion of the aorta that's at risk for rupture. Uh, but in the downstream aorta, you can still develop a type B dissection. We looked at a series of our patients. Um, this is unpublished, but we have this, collected this data. Uh, we found several patients who had a new dissection after having their ascending aorta replaced. Um, but it was only a small proportion of our patients in our series, less than one or two percent. Um, many of the patients had their surgery elsewhere, so I don't know the denominator exactly. But we know that risk is relatively low but still very real. So it's important to monitor things like your blood pressure and get imaging on a regular basis. If you have had a dissection, the story is a little different. If you've had had a dissection that's affected downstream parts of your aorta, you will be at risk for having uh, a reoperation on that aorta, a significant risk, 15 times the risk as if, if the downstream aorta wasn't dissected. We looked at patients in our center who had surgery with an, uh, a downstream, patients with connective tissue disorder who had surgery beyond their aortic root. Uh, we looked at um, 121 of these patients out of the 527 during that period of time who had connective tissue disorder, uh, where their repair extended beyond the left subclavian artery. The majority of them were chronic dissections. There were a few that did have aneurysms. They were relatively young. Most of their first operations were open, but the patients did okay. The mortality was two and a half percent, stroke rate was two and a half percent, and there were no patients with spinal cord injury in this group. And so, um, you know, it's, it's something that, that we can do well. When we followed these patients, interestingly, a lot of these patients needed additional interventions. 15% of them needed two or more interventions. Some of these were open. Of course, you can see the picture on the right is a picture of an open forco abdominal aneurysm repair. It's a long section of the aorta from the top of the chest down into the pelvis with branch reconstruction of all these other vessels. But a lot of these things can be treated endovascularly as well. And endovascular treatments, I think, are very reasonable and complementary to open surgery, even in patients with connective tissue disorder, as long as we understand the limitations of that technology. What we saw was that um, there was uh, about a 60% risk at six years for patients who had, a, um, who had a connective tissue disorder that had a single operation to go on and need some additional operations down the road. Aortic diseases can be fatal. We saw the aneurysms and the dissections in this talk that I gave, but they don't have to be. They don't have to be because you in this audience have the knowledge, uh, the caregivers that are taking care of you want to be your partners in taking care of you and your families. And as we continue to be better at learning about the basis of these diseases and how to treat these diseases better, we can continue to help people uh, live good, long lives. It requires multidisciplinary care and lifelong care for the patient and the family. Here, we do that with an aorta clinic or in our, in our aorta center. We have representatives of various specialties who all, who all take a special interest in taking care of patients with aortic disease. Imaging is a critical part of what we do. We do it often and, uh, and we are in, in innovating and studying how to do it better all the time. And by uh, combining that technology, we can come, on, come up with lifelong treatment plans to help you and your families. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'd like to open it up now for any questions from the audience. I'll, um, I'll stop sharing my screen. Great, and then we can see us. That was, that was excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you for warning people. I know there are people who don't wanna see those operations, but um, that was, that's really- that's some, really Yeah, some people love it. So I picked out a really bloody one for them. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, you did a great job of going through a lot of these questions here. So I'm going to ask some, get to some that were pre-submitted, pre and then we'll look at what was submitted tonight. Great. Um, if a patient with Marfan has a deep pectus excavatum, does that have any impact on how you do the aortic? Oh, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that question came up, Eileen. Um, we have, um, we just, we just are putting the finishing touches on a paper that's about to get published. And, um, um, at our center, um, I work alongside a guy named Dan Raymond, 
who's the director of our chest wall center. He's a thoracic specialist and takes care of a lot of people with chest wall deformities, not just pectus excavatum, but people have, you know, cancer reconstructions and a whole bunch of other things. And this first came up a few years ago where we had a patient um, who had a pectus excavatum that was actually really compromising the function of her heart. Um, she didn't have connective tissue disorder uh, per se. I'm sure she does with the combination of pectus. But she had a more congenital um, disease in her heart that had never been treated. And, um, and we were looking at it together and realized that we kind of had to take care of both at the same time. We were a little nervous about it at first because the concern is that the chest wall reconstruction might increase the risk of bleeding. Um, but we planned this thing. We got her through it just great. We took care of both the defect in her heart and her chest wall. And, um, and since then, um, we've done close to about 20 operations in patients electively where we've combined a, um, a kind of a really durable reconstruction for the chest wall with, with the complex uh, cardiovascular surgery. Most of those have been root operations because that's most common patients with a connective tissue disorder. But a couple of them have been multi-component operations where we've even done the root and the arch and a mitral valve and a couple other things. And I think that um, uh, with the modern um, uh, techniques for doing surgery safely, minimizing bleeding, and also optimizing pain control, uh, you can do both at the same time. Wow, wow, that's crazy. I thought that was only on TV. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, what typically happens first, an aneurysm or a dissection? I'm going to say aneurysm. And um, uh, although um, they're, they're not, they are two different sort of things. But I think the way to think about, to think about it is that both aneurysm and dissection, in a sense, aren't really uh, unique diseases. What they are is a complication. They're a late complication of a degenerative disease. You know, all that talk I gave in those first several slides about what's happening at the microscopic level, that degenerative process is the disease. And then at some, at some point, it presents with one of those late complications, those advanced stages of degeneration. I think most of the time we see that aneurysm starts to dissect. But um, depending on how much degeneration there is and where the stresses are in someone with connective tissue disorder, I think we see sometimes the dissections happen at kind of arteries that aren't really dilated. In old people with atherosclerotic disease, kind of degenerative aneurysms that aren't really probably the genetically triggered ones, they almost always get a really big aneurysm before it starts to rupture. Yeah. So if it does dissect, how long does somebody have to get to the hospital if it's an emergency situation? You know, it's not quite, it, it's all individual. Look, we don't know how many people die at home. So uh, there's no, there's no magic number to that question, but it's a little different than like a heart attack and a stroke. So like for heart attack or stroke, we talk about how you got to get somewhere within an hour. They talk about the golden hour or 90 minutes or something from, you know, from heart attack door to balloon time and all that stuff with the aorta usually um, we try to sort of get someone taken care of if it's, if it's ascending aorta. I mean, the sooner the better, of course. Right. Usually we have kind of a window of several hours. Like I don't like to see the sun rise or set on someone with a dissection. Right. If they have some extenuating circumstances, we have to do some additional testing to do the operation safely and the patient's otherwise stable. You know, we can do that. If they've got a bunch of blood that's collecting around their heart or one of the blood vessels downstream is compromised, not getting good blood flow, we got to move faster. Right. But they should put that timing on you. They should get to the, to the hospital as soon as possible. Like, Absolutely. Get yeah. to the hospital as fast as possible. And if you have any history of connective tissue disorder, even if a family member had sudden death, mm -hmm. um, it should be on the, you know, we should be thinking about aorta. And uh, we've been we've been doing you know with these aortic awareness projects, not just you know educating the um, the masses, but we've been you know doing our best to make sure that emergency medicine docs and people in the medical field are also thinking about that. Um, mm -hmm. It tends to it probably sat lower on the differential diagnosis for many years than it should, because it sounded like a rare thing. I think it's just way underdiagnosed, and as we're starting to get better at diagnosing it, it started to kind of rise. In, into the minds of folks. And it's gotta be on your mind if you're gonna make the diagnosis, gotta think about it. 
that leads to the next question, which is what is the best um, type of imaging to see that part of the aorta? CAT scan. CAT scan's the best. I don't think there's any question about that. It gives really clear images and, um, and it gives you kind of a nice comprehensive view. Echocardiogram is really good to look at the valve and the uh, valve function and, and the heart, but there's a lot of parts of the aorta you don't see very well with echo. MRI is also really good. It's just kind of hard to get to an MRI scanner quickly. So in emergency situations, definitely CT scan. Can you say something about x-rays? X-rays? Yes. Do they help? Uh, not really. Okay. I just wanted um, to say that out loud because, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Having said that, mm -hmm. if you have an x-ray and they say that there's a shadow that looks maybe enlarged or something, like you can sometimes see what they call a widened silhouette. Like it's, it's a blurry two-dimensional sort of view of things. Whereas yeah. the other imaging studies are 3D and you can see mm -hmm. it a whole lot more. Great. And the CT. And what does it feel like for the patient if they're having an aortic root problem? Can they feel that something is wrong? The section, yes. Um, and I think the most telling thing about aortic dissection, and I ask my patients all the time, and you know what? Every single patient will tell you the day, the date, the time, what they were doing, what they were wearing, okay? And, and what that tells you is it's often really abrupt out of nowhere, but it's also really serious. It's most common, uh, most commonly it's chest pain. That's a dissection. With regards to a root aneurysm, you typically won't feel anything, but if your valve is leaking because of it, because the valve leaks because as the root grows, the leaflets are sort of pulled apart and the valve doesn't meet in the middle and it leaks. An astute doctor can hear a murmur. Murmur is just that extra sound of some swirling blood flow related to the valve leaking. If it's leaking a lot, anybody, you know, anybody with a stethoscope can hear it. If it's leaking a little bit, um, a good doc can hear it. What's, what's the recovery like for patients who have this surgery? So the typical hospital stay in an elective operation is about five, well, I would say four to seven days. Sometimes mm -hmm. folks are getting out of here in four days. Um, and then it takes six weeks for your chest to heal. It's, it's like a bone in a cast. So I tell patients, walk, go up and down stairs, be active, but don't put any stress on your chest while the bone is healing. That takes time. And then it usually takes another month or so before you really start to get your energy back. And so I'll often tell folks to kind of forgive your body for that period of time. Because, you know, eight or nine weeks, you might have some day where you feel great. You're running around doing a whole bunch of things. And then the next day, you just feel wiped out. And that can be discouraging, but it shouldn't be because it's normal. And it's, there's like this upward sinusoidal curve where you have good days and a couple bad ones. And by two or three months, 10, 12 weeks, almost everybody's kind of feeling right back to having their strength and everything. After a dissection, it's different. Kind of depends on how sick you were when you came in. Like if you were having an organ that wasn't getting blood flow or you were in really kind of dire straits when you rolled in, it can take longer. Um, but I got plenty of people that were right on death's doorstep uh, that are living really full lives still. We actually had a, um, we did a personal perspectives panel back in December where we had four um, young adults who had had aortic surgery talk about life after surgery. And they described that up and down, good days, bad days, just yeah. the way you did. So if anybody wants to um, watch that, that's on our, our YouTube channel. That was a really great. That's video. awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Send me the link too so I can refer I will. to the patients. I will. We had Dr. Liang on giving the medical perspective in case they, in case they said something that they shouldn't have been doing. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, um, during that post-surgery time, what are the complicate, what are potential complications? What do you say if there are complications? Um, you know, most of the really dangerous stuff um, is going to happen during the hospital stay. You know, we don't let people out of the hospital unless we think it's safe to do so. But sometimes we see that, um, you know, it's, it's a big trauma to your chest wall and, and to your body and you can have some inflammation. So sometimes some fluid will collect in the spaces in your chest, like next to a lung or even in the space around your heart. We call that an effusion and um, that can make you short of breath. And that, that may need to be drained, treated with some medicine. Um, the other thing is abnormal heart rhythm. So atrial fibrillation is really common after any surgery in the chest, including, you know, esophagus and lung. 
And that's because the heart's kind of irritable from us being there is the way I think about it. Usually atrial fibrillation happens within the first couple of days. The, the peak incidence is day two after surgery. But some people, they didn't have any AFib and then they go home and they get AFib. It's what we always call it, atrial fibrillation, AFib. It might happen a week or two later. And what you might feel is palpitations or a racing heart. And if that heart rate's really fast, um, it's something that needs to be addressed and can be treated with medicine. So somebody asked a question about PTSD after surgery, and I happen to know that you're interested in this, so or you have some data on this. So can you I do, and, that? I, and I think I owe you something for we that. Do too. we will have more on our website about that at some point? But somebody I, did ask this question about PTSD. I'll get that to you. I'm glad they asked. I am too. <laughs> um, you know, I when I when I first started here, um, you know, as, a, as it was asked to kind of focus on aortic surgery, um, we. Uh, we were really focused on, um, this was in two th early 2000s, we were really focused on getting better at taking care of acute problems, you know, saving people with emergencies. And we, st and we still keep getting better at that. But I noticed that um, a lot of times um, the helicopter pad was bringing somebody in who had already survived an acute dissection. And and I don't mean any disrespect to the doctors out there that are taking care of people after we discharge them from having their emergency surgery. Um, but I think they weren't quite getting all the attention they needed or had a full understanding of the disease process they were dealing with. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so we decided that, you know, we need to pay closer attention to these aortic patients with aortic special care and make sure that the aortic people or the, the surgeons and the teams that are fixing the aorta, also monitor the aorta. I know that sounds obvious, but it's not the way it's sort of done everywhere, um, although it is now. And we understand the chronic nature of this so that we can stay on top of the disease process, but also to educate people. And one of the things that I noted when I kind of started building this aortic clinic here and following patients was that a lot of times after the emergency situation, they'd come in with just all this fear and and, you know, you're just trying to, you're just struggling to survive those first couple of months. And then at three months, you come in and you meet somebody and I'd sit down with them and I'd draw a picture of the aorta and I'd tell them all this stuff, talk about the three layers there. I didn't give them quite the lecture I gave today, <laughs> but, but I give them some information about what's going on. And I, I literally would see that like the furrow in the brow sort of relax. And I always thought this was really amazing how a little bit of knowledge about things can take and assuage fear in people. And so, um, and, and as I've like kind of gone on with this, I realized that um, having fear of, of what, you know, you're cruising around thinking your life is totally normal and you're healthy, a lot of, especially young people, because you know, young people, we think they're, they're immortal. And then something hits you like this. Um, I, I ran into a couple of patients who were just really like um, paralyzed by it. Like, like anytime they had a little as twinge of pain or something like that, they thought something bad was happening to them again. And, um, and so I, you know, take time to talk to people about it. And then we decided that maybe we should study this. And so we sent a survey um, and, and we're not the first ones to do surveys, ask people about sort of quality of life and lifestyle stuff after aortic dissection disease. But we were the first ones to sort of include in that questionnaire a screening tool for PTSD. So there's a four question questionnaire. It's kind of like there's like a screening tool for alcoholism that the family practice docs will use. There's another one for PTSD. And there's a series of questions that, uh, that they'll ask and they're related to um, you know, feelings and, and uh, um, avoidance of activities and things like that that are related to a situation that reminds them of it. And we found that 40, I think it was 43% of patients answered one of those four questions positive. And they're not like little wimpy questions. They're like serious questions. Like, um, you know, again, like do, do you avoid situations that, you know, would put you in, in um, uh, do, do, you, do you have bad dreams about it? You know, like serious stuff. And uh, um, a really positive screening study is when three out of four of those questions are answered positive. And we found that 23% of dissection survivors answered that positive. Now we sent this survey out to an old po to a population of patients that we already had on file 
Many of them were answering the survey six or seven years later. And they were still answering 20, over 20% of the time that they had some symptoms of PTSD. And only a couple of those patients had actually gotten diagnosed and treated for PTSD. So it's real, but it's really treatable. But you, you can't treat it unless you kind of get direction. And, and it's okay if the stuff you're feeling related to all this stuff um, is what you're feeling. And it's, um, it, it's something that can be managed. So, um, you know, it, if, uh, if you think that you're having any of those kind of problems, it's something you should talk with your primary care doctor about. I think there's some, some improving resources for managing PTSD, um, although we can do a lot better with a lot of the sort of, um, you know, mental illnesses in general. But PTSD is one I think we, we're making really good improvement on. Well, yeah, we're doing a lot in this area in mental health. And that panel I just talked about, they talk about that a lot also. And uh, the foundation's doing a lot in terms of virtual support groups and um, we have a lot more coming up in the whole mental health area to That's uh, awesome. destigmatize it because, you know, we have doctors like you who are taking care of the medical side and the patients and, you know, everybody has to live day to day with these conditions. And so it's not just about your medication and your surgery, but, you know, your mental health as well. So we yeah. look for more on that from us this year. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll start. I'll bring up the conversation times sometimes with patients and, 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 you know, they might be like a little awkward, but like, you know, you're my surgeon, like we should be talking about more serious stuff, but it's serious. You have to, I want you to not only survive this thing, but like to live your life, like have a good quality of life. We got to address all of that. Absolutely. Um, it's a question about, um, we're going to keep going if it's okay with you. you I'm know, here. I'm hanging out. I'm in my office. I'm at work. I'm, I'm not home. We're good. Okay, okay good. Um, no kids, no dogs. So we're okay. Okay. Right. Um, do you have difficulty obtaining insurance approval for cardiac rehab after a leg surgery? This is another thing. We included this in the most, we did an updated survey. We included this. We're still crunching the numbers, but um, there were a significant number of patients that had that problem. Um, and I found that problem. It kind of drives me nuts um, because you can get cardiac rehab like this for, you know, like a coronary stent. Not, not that that's small stuff, but um, it's certainly nothing like the magnitude of an aortic dissection or aortic operation. Um, one of, and I've asked for help from some like general cardiologists who prescribe cardiac rehab, um, to try and put together something for us to help educate people out there. I guess there's certain ways that, you know, you can code things and work things, not gaming the system, but just working around some of the, the weird issues with insurance companies. You know, you, you want an insurance company every once in a while, that'll be, you know, reading out of a catalog about what the indications for rehab are. And because aortic disease is relatively rare compared to myocardial infarction or heart attack, it might not be in their list. And they're always looking for ways not to pay for things, but there's ways around that. And um, I, I think that would be something we should also work on together. Yeah, I see it, and, and, but I think we can improve that. Sounds good. Is the, is the recovery harder for patients with connective tissue conditions as opposed to patients who don't have Tissue not, not from a cardiac standpoint. Um, what I would say is that um, if someone's got a connective tissue disorder, uh, a connective tissue condition that's affected their musculoskeletal system, um, it might be a little bit harder. So, you know, you got bad feet or bad joints, bad back. Um, the key is to kind of get you up and get you moving as soon as possible. Um, but other than that, no. Okay, good. We're going to ask, I have a couple of COVID questions here. Sure. So if somebody's facing elective um, aortic surgery, should they get the vaccine first or should they hold off getting having the surgery? I would say um, if you can get the vaccine um, whenever it's available based on sort of those risks and things, get the vaccine. Because um, I don't want you to miss the chance to get the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And then you should be able to schedule your surgery within a couple of weeks after that. As I was waiting to log on tonight, I am so Illinois just um, announced that if you have heart condition, that you will soon be eligible for a vaccine, even if you're if you're younger, even if you're under 65. So we're getting there. Cool. We are, we are getting there. Is there a limit to how much of the aorta can be replaced in both the ascending and or descending? Section? No. No limit. We can replace it all. 
but we, you know, I, I can replace any aorta all at one time, but we don't do it that way because the more we do it one time, the harder it is on you to recover. So I have a whole bunch of patients who've had their whole aorta replaced and repaired, but we do it in stages. Uh, and, um, and, you know, knowing ahead of time, if someone's young or has connective tissue disorder, um, you know, we'll, we, we can do a little bit more to make, make a next operation easier if we're sort of looking at it with this lifelong approach. I, I know you talked about the different types of um, valves. What's the lifespan of the different valve type? What lasts the longest and what would you select? So um, mechanical valves last the longest. Um, I've seen a couple that are 30 or, 40 year, 30 or 40 years old when I've had to kind of go back and reoperate on an aneurysm or something like that. And they, they still look pristine. So, you know, those parts don't wear out, but you can still have problems with them. A lot of times related to the blood thinners that are required. So you can have bleeding or clotting problems, but also you can have problems with what I call the patient prosthesis interface. So even though the parts don't wear out, they get sewn into a human being. And so you can get some scar tissue that can grow around it and compromise the way the valve works, kind of like, like uh, kind of gums up the, the valve a little bit. Um, the other option are biologic valves. Um, biologic valves are manufactured either from the tissue around a cow's heart or a pig. Um, and it's really, the way I think about it, it's more like a really fancy piece of leather. So, uh, you know, a really fancy tanned piece of leather can last a long time, but if it's being used every day, eventually it's going to wear out. So those valves typically last somewhere between 10 and 20 years. 15 is the average. The uh, living valve options are a Ross procedure. Again, not a, usually a great option for some of the root aneurysm or connective tissue disorder, but good for kids. Um, and that's where you take a pulmonic valve and move it from the right side of the heart to the left. So it's a living valve. Um, and then there's a couple other procedures, something called an Ozaki procedure, but we don't really have really long-term data on that, but it's still a piece of pericardium that's treated with chemicals. So, you know, it may be similar to a biologic valve. We'll see. Um, we did talk about the uh, pairs uh, procedure a little bit um, before. Um, Helene did put in the chat box a link to a big presentation that we had last year during our summit that was given by Dr. Duke Cameron and um, Tal Goldsworthy, um, who I believe is the creator of that procedure. Um, do you want to say something about the pair surgery more than what you said before? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think it's ready for prime time. I, you know, it, it has to be studied. And the problem with it is that it has to be studied for a really long time because it's being applied to people with sort of dilated, but not really dilated aortas. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we'll see with time what happens. Um, there's like one report of a patient who died after the procedure, not from the aortic problem, but something else. And uh, the, the team that wrote about it was excited to see that the, on, under the microscope, some of that aortic tissue looked like the, the integrity of it was still maintained. The architecture was maintained, but um, I, you know, I'll tell you from my lab, the architecture in the aorta is variable depending on where you take the biopsy from. And yeah. So there's a lot to learn about it. Um, my concern also is that it's a pretty big operation. So you're opening the chest, you're dissecting everything out, including the coronary arteries to put this wrap in place. And yet we don't really know for sure um, if it's a kind of a definitive repair. There's a couple patients that are like 10, 12, 15 years out or something like that. And their aorta hasn't grown because it's kind of scarred in with this mesh. And that's promising. Good. But um, time, will tell. time will tell. Maybe it'll be like something that, you know, when, when time proves that it works, we can even find new ways to do it where we use a robot to deliver it through the ribs or something like that. That, that all sounds great. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if maybe we, you know, whatever we learn from how that mesh interacts with the aorta, maybe we can even do it endovascularly, like the way we deliver stents and we can do something like that. I, th I think there's a, there's a lot to learn yet. What about, but, but you mentioned stents, what about stents or minimally invasive surgery um, with the connective tissue patients that we're talking about? Yeah, for minimally invasive really depends on what we're treating. So if we're treating sort of a short segment of the aorta and we can get to it through a small incision, we can treat it that way. Um, with regards to stents, I know there's a lot of like 
concern about stents in connective tissue aortas, um, but um, you know they work they work well. And so as long as you understand that in order for that stent graft to work well, it has to have some normal aorta to hold on to um, for it to seal. And uh, there might not be a whole lot of really normal aorta in someone with connective tissue disorder. Um, that might be a problem. Or there might be only a normal, a bit of aorta that's only normal for a limited period of time before it starts to break down. If you're in an emergency situation, it's a great choice. And then if you've had previous open surgery and we can put the stent into a previous graft, that's also a really nice choice. But for now, those devices are made for treating kind of the straight segments of the aorta. Um, they're not really great for the branch segments of the aorta, but we've been using them in combination with open surgery to do multi-stage reconstructions. They got a whole bunch of patients where we replaced their whole aorta from their left ventricle to their pelvis. And uh, they often have stents as part of that kind of multi-stage reconstruction. Wow. So um, do, all, do all patients with Marfan or low seats need aortic surgery? No. Okay. No. And, and that goes back to what I was saying, like you're not your genes. You, you know, some people just get really lucky. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, the genetic abnormality didn't affect sort of the cells that make up the aorta. Um, some people just have, you know, just the root is the problem. Um, some people just have, you know, one part of their aorta affected by it. Um, but life is long and, you know, we only know what we know during sort of the windows when we're looking inside. Mm -hmm. And so, um, even if things look good on a screening study at some point, it's important to probably get an image every few years if you know you're, you're affected by the disorder from a genetic standpoint. Right. All right, I'm gonna ask you to hold on a second. We're gonna, we're gonna kind of do, um, do our wrap up here. Just wanna remind everybody, I see people putting their questions in the chat box. I'm not sure I can download those after. So if you have a question in the chat box, please put it in the Q&A box while we're finishing up so that I can um, circle back with you after and have our nurse. Um, get back to you and if she needs help, she'll obviously ask Dr. Roselli for his um, input on those as well. So let me just get to um, the rest of our little presentation here. Um, so again, there's Jan Lynch, our nurse at our, in our help center. She is, she is incredible. Um, and so if you have additional questions tonight um, about this topic or any other topic that's related to uh, Martha and Lois Deep's heads, um, go to markvan.org slash ask and submit your question there and Jan will answer you. That is seriously the fastest way to get to her. Um, also, this is the second in our surgery series. We have two more coming up. Next week, we have um, Dr. Joseph Caselli from Baylor St. Luke's talking about open thoracoabdominal repair. And then the week after that, we have Dr. Anthony Caffarelli from Hope Hospital talking about surgery on the aortic arch. We divided it up like this because heard that was important to do. So we're able to feature a lot of our amazing surgeons in this series. Um, we mentioned COVID a little bit tonight. Um, there are a couple of questions on that. Obviously, this has been a main um, issue for us and our community the past year. Um, we've done webinars. We've, we've talked about research. We've talked about vaccines. Our professional advisory board has had statements, you know, when, when it was back to school time, when it, when it was a time to do elective surgeries again on the vaccine. And we also have a weekly um, COVID support group. I think it's weekly um, COVID support group Monday nights um, for COVID related anxiety. And of course we have um, mask. Um, you can show your Martha and Louis Seeds Beds pride, wear your mask. Um, public service announcement from the Martha and Foundation. Um, and we'll send the links out to all of these things in our follow-up tomorrow, which will include a link to this webinar. And finally, we have a lot more coming up this year. Um, as Michael mentioned, our annual conference will be virtual July 8th to 11th. We have more virtual support groups besides the COVID one um, for, you know, whether it's uh, by age or parents or newly diagnosed. We have our 2021 Walk for Victory season where we have, we have the first few walks are gonna be virtual in March. We're keeping our fingers crossed. We can be in person after that, but we'll take it month by month and see what the situation calls for. Um, just because a locale might say that we can do it doesn't mean that we should. We want everybody to be safe and healthy. Um, connect with us and we'll also have some virtual walks. We have a global virtual walk. Plenty of places for you to connect with us. Obviously, always follow us on social media. You get all the best information, stories, meet people. 
and um, you know, tell us what's important to you because that's what matters. Um, we are in Marfan Awareness Month. We have a lot going on. I mentioned um, the mask, but we also have our new t-shirts. We have lots of digital swag. We're gonna have a virtual Hill Day on, next week um, where we have a new platform. It'll be easy for all of you to contact your lawmakers. We'll obviously see what's happening in Congress, maybe change that date if we have to, but fingers crossed. And then Marfan Awareness Day of Giving is on the 24th of February. And you'll hear more about that as well too. So um, obviously we are here for you and we're thrilled to bring you know, doctors like Dr. Roselli um, into, your, into your living room or wherever you're watching this tonight. Um, so Dr. Roselli, any final words tonight um, on the presentation or, or words of wisdom for our, our community here? Um, no, I really just wanna say thanks. Thanks everyone for your attention and um, um, thanks for, uh, for being involved really. Um, you know, I hope, I hope that uh, anything you learn today, you can share with somebody else because um, the more we connect, the more we, we can help somebody. Um, it's one of the coolest things I, I, I've noticed in my career in medicine is how um, sometimes the littlest thing that I learn from a patient um, might sell, save the next, next person's life. And, uh, and we can all kind of share knowledge that way. So um, thanks for this opportunity to do so. Well, you are very welcome. We are thrilled to have you. And for anybody who is out there, we have almost 100 people on live tonight. If there's anything else that we can do for you, you'll all have my email tomorrow and feel free to contact me and all of us at the foundation because we are here for you. So thank you so much and have a great night. Wait, don't hang up. I have to answer the medical student that sent me something in the chat. Okay, <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'm gonna give her my email. Oh, is that Abigail? Yeah. I, I told her to email me separately. So we'll get her. We'll get oh, her. Sure. All right. Well, okay. Very good. Thanks. Okay. Okay. I'll get bye you. Everyone. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.